This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. Most Christians segment and compartmentalize their lives, and they say, okay, I want Jesus involved here, but this is off limits. I want him involved over here, but I don't want his inclusion here. And so because we, we make our lives, Christian lives, segmentable, then any area that we don't give over to God, we automatically think is neutral. And he said, it's not that way. God still loves you, but any area you don't give over to God, you're assuming that you're going at that area on your own, but you're really not. C.S. Lewis said it like this, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. So if you don't have God's involvement in it, it means somebody else's involvement is in it and you're going the way Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me wanna dance and sing with every single breath I bring. I will bring this up. Today. Today. Today with Jeff Fines. Hey there, my name is Aaron, and you're listening to Today with Jeff Fines. We're continuing on our series called The Resistance. In this message, Pastor Jeff is going to be reminding us not to underestimate the power of Satan, and it's his desire to take hold of all the areas of our lives. Pastor Jeff is covering the topics of truth, lies, and financial freedom. If you've missed any of this series, you can catch up. Just search for Today with Jeff Finds on your favorite podcast app. But for now, let's join Pastor Jeff. We're in a series called uh, The Resistance. We've said that According to the Bible, the same Bible that teaches you and me that God exists and that he sent his son to die on a cross for us also tells us that there's an entity in this world that is diametrically opposed to anything good happening in our life. And when you underestimate his power, then you won't be on the lookout for it. And it's possible that even though we are supposed to be more than conquerors, we can live our whole lives in an area of defeat. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus said, I've come to bring you life. There's a way that leads to life, but there's also the prince of the power of the air who is here to destroy you. Now, to help you understand how this really happens or where it really goes, I had a professor uh, when I was in seminary that wrote this word on the screen and he said, students, now remember, he's talking to about 40 future preachers here. He said, students, look at this word. This is what's wrong with the American church, he said. And he said, most Christians segment and compartmentalize their lives. And they say, okay, I want Jesus involved here, but this is off limits. I want him involved over here, but I don't want his inclusion here. And so because we, we make our lives, Christian lives, segmentable, then any area that we don't give over to God, we automatically think is neutral. And he said, it's not that way. God still loves you, but any area you don't give over to God, you're assuming that you're going at that area on your own, but you're really not. C.S. Lewis said it like this, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. So if you don't have God's involvement in it, it means somebody else's involvement is in it. And you're going the way that is the wide gate in that particular area of your life. Now, isn't it true, folks, stay with me. Isn't it true that some areas in your life appear to be, if you take this route, appear to be uh, binding when in all actuality they're freeing. And other areas in your life appear to be freeing, but in all reality, if you start down that road, you'll end up in bondage. Let me give you two examples. First, if you're on the outside looking in at Christianity, what do you think? When you share your faith with a friend, what does he say? Or what does she think? No way am I going to become a Christ follower. All those rules and regulations, right? I'm not going to go to church all the time. I have to give money and all this stuff. They're on the outside looking in and they're still placing Christianity with 
all the other religions in the world that says you do, you do, you do, and you might get in. You pray five times facing a certain direction. You go on a pilgrimage, and then you keep this long list of do's and don'ts. And if you do these things, God may let you in. They're still, still thinking about religion. Christianity is absolutely different. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. You don't justify yourself before God. If you could do that, you wouldn't need the cross. God justifies you, makes you right before himself by sending his son to pay the penalty for your sin, past, present, future. So on the outside, you look at Christianity, that's binding. But on the inside, you know, no, it's freeing. It means I'm accepted by God on the basis of what Jesus did, not on my past, present, or future failures. Now, let's take drug addiction. That works the opposite way, right? Drug addiction, you think, well, that's freeing until you're addicted. Think about it. There's a, there's a debate going on right now, right, whether we should legalize marijuana. Now, look at both sides of the argument. One argument says, hey, I'm not going to have anybody, especially the government, tell me what I can and cannot do. The other side, wait a minute. We're not trying to bind you. We're trying to free you because they believe firmly that marijuana is a gateway drug, and they're afraid that many young people, if we legalize marijuana, will start to smoke it freely and then move on to the next addiction. And because we know that other addictions kill, they're saying, hey, let's limit this in some way so it's not so easily accessible. Now, think about it just for a moment. This a Saturday, we had a funeral here of a young, young man. Place was packed. He became a Christian, but he had his addiction before. He spent the last few years really trying to conquer this thing. But in the end, it got him. And he overdosed and he died. He lost his battle, but he did win the war. He was right with God, but still the addiction battle is so strong and any addict knows easy to grab onto, easy to grab onto, hard to let go of. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman died a couple of weeks ago. One of my favorite actors, first movie I saw him in was Patch Adams. Great actor, very talented. Whether you like movies or not, that's not the point. This guy was incredibly gifted. He prophesied his own death. He told his friends that he would probably die of a heroin overdose. He did. He knew that it had grabbed onto him so hard. It was so difficult to let go. Here's another. How many of you watched that 70s show? Anybody? When it came out? I watched it, because I, but I watched it to see her. I mean, <laughs> guys are like that. Put a pretty girl on television, you know, until they get married. Things change, of course. And so this is uh, Lisa Robin Kelly, and she was on that 70s show. Here's what she looked like just before she died. 43 years old, she died. The before and after are amazing with her. Drugs just destroyed any beauty that she had. Now, I go this direction because I'm trying to tell you something, that there are things that the Bible teaches that appear on the outside to be bondage, but they're not. They're incredibly freeing, but you've got to trust it. And I want to talk to you about something this weekend that is destroying so many people. Let me read the passage again. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Remember what I said last week? There is nothing happening inside you that can change the love of God for you, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So a pastor would contradict himself if he gave you this verse one week and then came out and tried to make you feel guilty the next week, right? That, how, is that, how can you harmonize that? You can't. So maybe what Pastor Jeff is doing is not trying to bring guilt because he can't. Nothing's happening inside you that would change the love of God for you. Maybe what he's trying to do is actually help me. So I want you to answer some questions for me. I want you to answer some questions for me. Number one, what is the number one cause of stress in a marriage? What, do I have to get you to sing it? <laughs> Everybody in the room knows what it is. Money. Second, what causes a new marriage to disintegrate faster than any other outside agent? What, are you shy or something? <laughs> Come on, money, money, money. Come on, sing the song. Here we go. Three, what do couples fight over more than anything else? Money. Now, by the way, you're three for three. You're doing well. Four, what is the devil's primary tool utilized to cause tension in any relationship? I'll tell you what it is. That may not be money. Get two Christian business partners that go into business together. They'll be fighting like everybody else over some period of time over what? Money. 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 Now, I want to talk to you because Robin and I, I was 32 years old. We were in New Zealand. My father had taught me some great financial principles in my life that I had adhered to in most of my 20s, but I started making a little more money, not a lot, but a little more. And all of a sudden, I find myself seated with my wife across the table from a financial advisor, and my wife, who hardly ever shows any emotion, starts to cry. And that 
I, that just opened my eyes. I, I have made my wife cry because the problem was with me. How many of you know who this guy is? He's the guy that sued McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's. Do you know why? He said they made him fat. <laughs> true story. All true. What I realized in that moment with Robin is I'm the one that's culpable. That we're in the situation we're in because of my lack of leadership in this area. And then it dawned on me. It was like a light went on. Wow. The devil wants me to be in financial bondage because when you're in financial bondage, you treat your wife differently. You treat your kids differently. You treat the dog differently. And any amount of joy you have in your life quickly dissipates because you've got this debt ball and chain hanging over your head. And it dawned on me, man, what the devil really wants is for me to be in bondage so that it ruins every aspect of my life and no other area of your life has the potential to ruin every other aspect of your life than financial bondage. So here's what I understood. The devil tells us three lies. Lie number one is this. It's my money and I can do whatever I want with it. Now, we know the truth is it's your wife's money and you do what she tells. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> The Bible says, the Bible says, and I've read this verse numerous times in Psalm 24, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the sea, he established it upon the waters. The psalmist says, everything came from God, everything belongs to God. But in 1 Chronicles 29, the passage that we're concentrating on this weekend, wealth and honor come from you. Who's you? God, you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. The writer says, God is the one that gives you your wealth. God is the one who can lift you up. God is the one who can humble you. God is the one who gives you power and strength. God is the source. God. And then he says in verse 14, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. You know what David does? He gets to the altar and he's about to present the gift on behalf of his people and he's proud of himself. Man, look what we're doing. We're giving to God. And then it dawns on him, wait a minute. <laughs> All of this came from God anyway. I'm just returning to God what is rightfully is. Now, you remember I told you about the lady who's in the airplane, uh, airport terminal. And uh, she's reading the newspaper. And all of a sudden, the guy next to her that she does not know digs into her bag of chocolate chip cookies. And she hears the rustling. And she looks over and he takes two cookies and smiles at her. Well, in order to claim her territory, she puts the newspaper down. She takes three cookies. Smiles at him. He takes three more. This goes on for a while. She's thinking of all the audacity. There's one cookie left. He takes it. And then takes the paper, crumbles it up, and throws it away. She doesn't say anything. She just goes to her seat on the airplane. She sits down, opens up her purse to discover her unopened package of chocolate chip cookies. She had been eating his cookies the whole time. And the point of the story is, the manner in which you use the cookies really is determined by who you think they belong to. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, how does this get me in bondage, though? First Chronicles 29. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands is strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. The Bible says this. Look, here's what the devil's doing. In no way does he want God involved in this area of your life. That would bring far too many blessings. So what he does is he, it's a battlefield of the mind. He speaks to you. And he tries to convince you that you owe no thanksgiving or gratitude to anybody other than yourself for anything that you have. And he wants you to possess an attitude that locks God out of this area of your life. Now, let me go back and say what I did before. You're still saved. God still loves you. There's nothing happening inside you or outside you that's going to change that because that's found through the cross. But the devil doesn't want... God involved in this area of your life. There's just too much joy in it. But to you on the outside who've never tried it, now to those of us who are in it, we know. Those who are on the outside, you think it's bondage. It's not. It's freeing. It's kind of like this, and it's not the potato head family. <laughs> I don't speak goldfish, but I'm assuming if I could, I think the goldfish would say, you got a pretty good life here. got a little island. No predators. My own little home. Don't have to share it. Okay, he might be lonely. But think of what he's really missing. <laughs> There's a whole big aquarium out there. There's a whole big ocean out there. And for a lot of us, when it comes to this area of our lives, we get a little ahead and we think, oh, look how good life is. We got no idea how grand life could be. 
Number one, it's my money. I can do what I want to. Number two, second lie, money and things will bring me ultimate satisfaction. Whoever loves money, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10 says, has, never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Now let me play a little game here. All right, I'm going to take $100. Hold that for me, if you would, just a second. Let's pretend like, let's pretend like, I've got my eye on that, by the way. Let, let's, let's pretend like that's your money, okay? And I'm coming down after the service. And what's your name? Chris. And Chris, Chris says, Pastor Jeff, I'd like you to have this $100 bill, okay? Now, how many of you think your pastor loves money? Yeah, you're smart. Doggone straight. You're right. I love money, right? Come on. Any pastor who tells you he doesn't love money, run away, because he's not going to tell you the truth. I'm like anybody else. What is the first thing I think of when I see this? Golf balls. Yeah. Okay, after 10% to God, of course. Now, does the Bible say you can't love money? That's not the point the Bible makes. The Bible says that when you love money to the point it becomes your idol. When it is the thing that you pursue, then it's all out of whack and priorities are gone. When it's that thing you think will give you that thing that's missing in your life, and the more, come on, how many of you think, man, if I could just get to that number, I'd be happy. Oh, that's what you're thinking. If I could just make this much money, oh, that would be enough. It will never be enough. Never. I go back to the lady that's on the mat in Zimbabwe in 2008, I believe. We went over when Zimbabwe was in complete financial ruin. Uh, they actually printed a, uh, 50, a $500 trillion bill. A $500 trillion bill is the highest in inflation known to man since civilization began. And that wouldn't even buy you a loaf of bread. And we went out to the rural areas, and I wanted to interview some of the people who were struggling. So we took a camera, went out to Chittimoyo Hospital, and I told the guys, let's go out into the village and let's meet some people. First person we met, there was an old lady probably 70 some years old, seated on a mat. The totality of her existence was a mud hut about as big as this part of the stage right here. That's where she lived. She had one goat and she'd go down to the river three miles away to get water every day. And her food was a bowl of meal every day. Okay. I sat down on the mat beside her and through a translator, I asked her, okay, if we could get you anything that you needed or wanted, what is the one thing we could help you with? What, 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 what could get you? And I thought this was going to be a benevolent video, right? We're going to do something fantastic. She snaps back through the translator. Everything I truly want, I already have. So I'm intrigued. I say, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? She, she, and she said, well, it's not a what, it's a who. I have Jesus. When you have Jesus, he's all you need. So here is this woman who has nothing, who's in poverty, and she's happy because she says all she really needs is Jesus. And when you have him, you don't need anything else. The Minerth and Meyer Clinic is supposed to be the top psychologists, psychiatrists on the planet, right? They wrote a book called Happiness is a Choice. And in the book, they say that many people choose happiness, but they never find it. And the reason is, is because they look in the wrong places. They seek for an inner peace and joy, never find it. They seek for happiness and materialism, don't find it. They seek for joy and sexual prowess, but end up with fleeting pleasures and a bitter long-term disappointment. They seek inner fulfillment by obtaining positions of power in corporations, in communities, in their own families. They remain unfulfilled. And then they go on to say, millionaire businessmen come to my clinic. They tell me that they have big houses, yachts, and condominiums. They say they have nice children, a beautiful mistress, an unsuspecting wife, and secure corporate positions. Yet they have suicidal tendencies. They want to kill themselves. They have everything this world has to offer except one thing they are seeking the most. They cannot find inner peace and joy. I think of King Solomon. Here's a man of great wealth. He killed 30 oxen and 100 sheep every day to feed 14,000 people in his palace. How would you like to feed 14,000 people? What do they do? You just ring the doorbell? We're hungry. 14,000 of us. Every day, he possessed what seemed to be unending knowledge we know from outside sources other than the Bible that he wrote 3,000 works of profound truths. Seven to 900 are recorded in our Old Testament. He wrote over 1,000 songs. He was said to be the wisest of the wise. He ate the finest food. He possessed all the expensive items of gold and silver. And he surrounded himself with literally hundreds of beautiful women across the land. And yet he gets to the end of his life after having had all of this. And he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11, everything I look for in pleasure, good or bad, under the sun was a chasing after the wind. It's a Hebrew word that means the harder you pursue something, the more it eludes you. Why is it 
that the Bible repeatedly reminds us that money and stuff will never bring us the satisfaction that God can, and yet there's a lady who lives in total abject poverty in Zimbabwe who gets that, and we who live in the affluent West don't. Notice I said we. We. That means you and me. Us. Uh, can I talk to you? I'd like, I talked to you about Joseph last week. Can I mention about Jacob this week? Not that Jacob. The other Jacob. <laughs> Jacob and Rachel. Yeah. Remember what happened to Jacob? Jacob's daddy didn't love him. He, he grew up in a time of primogeniture. So Jacob wasn't the oldest, so he was kind of put on the back burner, and that, that put a hole in his heart. Same hole some of you had because of your relationship with your mom and dad. But he tried to meet that the wrong way. He tried to steal the birthright from Esau. Instead, Esau wants to kill him, and his father dies of a broken heart. He runs away to live with Uncle Laban. He sees Rachel. He's enamored. He says, man, now if I can just, you know, first if it was I get the birthright, now if I can just get the girl. And then he got the girl. And he had her sister too. It's in the Bible. Rachel, Leah. And then he says, if I can just get that land. And then he got the land too. If I can just get those goods. He got the goods. He got everything. And still, he can't fill the void in his life. And then you know what happens? Somewhere along this whole process, God shows up and he wrestles God. And the reason God shows up is he's trying to teach Jacob a lesson. That is, Jacob, everything you're striving to get through illegitimate means, I was going to give you anyway. You're going about it the wrong way. And the Bible says, then the man said after the wrestling match, your name will no longer be called Jacob, which means wrestling with men, but Israel, which means to wrestle with God, because you have struggled with God and man and have overcome. He overcame. I mean, I looked at that and thought, wait a minute. Jacob wrestled God and won? That's quite a resume. One knockout. I knocked out God. You know, who's going to fight the guy who knocked out God? You know, that's not what it means, obviously. He overcame something inside him, and it was this. He overcame the lie that all of these things would fill the void in his heart. And he gave everything over to God, and it changed his life. And then in Genesis 31, 31, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel. He's walking away from the fight. The sun rises above him, and he was limping because of his hip. Tim Keller, in commentary on this passage, says he might have been limping, but he was limping with a smile because he had given everything over to God. Now, here's why I tell you this. You and I have a hard time learning this lesson. And so you and I treat money like we do food. Uh, Do any of you eat not when you're hungry, but for a different reason. Yeah. Do you ever eat when you're depressed just to get a little food high, right? You know, I like the t-shirt that says, hand over the chocolate, nobody gets hurt. Everybody has a food that heals your depression, or at least you think so. Mine is chocolate covered raisins, if any of you want to know. (laughs) But we tend to, when we get depressed, to use food like a drug, like a high, and we'll go to the fridge and grab some ice cream, not because we're hungry, just because we want to feel good. I do the same. You say, yeah, sure you do. Look at you. What do you know about that? Hey, I know everything about that. The reason I run 15, 20 miles a week is not because I like running. It's so I can go to the fridge and eat the ice cream. (laughs) It's the only reason I run. Now, we do the same thing with money. It's a sad thing. But in affluent West, we purchase things because it gives us a temporary high. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You hear what he's saying? See, if your motivation is to employ these principles I'm going to give you in the coming weeks so that you can get more and more wealth to spend on yourself. You're on the wrong road. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Fines wherever you listen to podcasts. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are my wonder You are the wonder Today 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 with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.